Nicole, thank you so much for being here to talk about share height and the, the disappearance of share height and the reappearance yeah. of share height in this film. Um, can you tell us how did you come to tell her story in this film? Like, was there an inciting incident or an inspirational moment that that made you say, "I have to tell, I have to tell her story here"? Yeah, well, I I was saying actually, and when when I introduced the film, that I that I ran into the height report in my mom's little chest that she hid stuff that she didn't want me to see in when I was twelve years old. We all we all have those, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, exactly. And I grew up kind of in a, you know, in Eugene, Oregon in the seventies and there wasn't that much going on or that much on TV. So, um, I didn't have the internet. So the height report was just like an amazing, amazing thing to encounter. And, you know, sex ed when we were growing up was mostly about venereal diseases and not getting pregnant. And, um, we had this little blue pamphlet that had line drawings of the body, but no nipples or any kind of, you know, anything to see on it. Um, and that was pretty much it. So I also, you know, I moved in progressive circles. I was very open. I actually, you know, um, but, but when I read her obituary and I thought back on it, I thought there are so many things that I only know because I read that book happened to other women. Um, and I kind of only really have a sense of the sort of like breadth and diversity of female sexuality. Um, in a in a very intimate way from those things that I read that women said in her book, you know, so I I was very very interested in how a voice like that and a person like that and kind of a happening like that that the height report really was like a cultural phenomenon. How does that disappear from the record? Some when somebody does something that kind of iconoclastic and different that makes a huge difference, you know, I mean we all kind of know. Okay, it's the patriarchy, you know, right. that <laughs> that shuts it down. But how does that happen, and what does it look like? Mm -hmm. And so then, um, you know, I I ran into this group of people that who were starting NBC News Studios, and these young producers who were also thinking the same thing, but they were in their 30s, and they were coming to the idea of share height from why did we never hear about her? Right. I was like a did feminist studies or gender studies, and nobody talked about that, you know. Um, and so we um, discovered that we were both interested in the same story and decided to collaborate on it um, and then join forces with this machine um, in, in L.A. To, to tell the story. And the more people we kind of engaged and showed the materials and talked to about it, um, the more kind of like passion and inter interest there was in, um, in bringing it back because, of course, you know, right after we started working on it, we got the the you know, row reversal leak mm -hmm. happened and, and, you know, it just started to feel more and more urgent and timely as we went along. So um, how did you start amassing all of these archival materials, just talking to more and more people who knew her or, you know, finding, you know, pulling on the thread and seeing what was out there? Yeah, I mean, it was really like, as you can kind of see in the film, it was really like um, here was somebody who was creating an art piece of their life and a film of their life from very early on and kind of all the way along. So it was like she had left treasure everywhere, mm -hmm. you know? And so one of the most, um, one of the stories I love the most is that um, we had this co-producer, Eleanor, who, Eleanor West, and she read that, found that article about the cake party where she, you know, make, has a big cake for the 3000th survey mm -hmm. and thanks everyone who worked on the project. Mm -hmm. And we were really excited about showing this sort of collective organizing feminist part of how the project came together. So we called all of those people, most of whom were men, and, you know, discovered that most of them had had relationships with Cher, had helped her in her work, were wonderful, lovely guys, mm -hmm. and also most of them were photographers, artists, <laughs> and they had collaborated with her. So, it w but we weren't talking about, oh, I have three pictures, you know? They were like, I have boxes and boxes of pictures, you know? Yeah. Um, so there was that kind of material, and then there was this incredible trove at the Schlesinger Archive at Harvard, where she had given given all of her archive, and that was where we got the really intimate stuff that enabled us to write the Dakota Johnson, you know, narration, and kind of I think put hopefully put you in her POV, because she was um, writing on scraps of paper all the time. She was kind of hypographic, so she would write like there would be like a whole pile of like sticky notes where she'd be on a plane 
and would have just broken up with somebody and would just be writing on every single sticky note, you know, or the back of an opera program or whatever. You know, she'd be writing about sex on the back of an opera program and, you know, about opera on the back of (laughs) something about like an article about sex and usually in that beautiful red pen. And so we had um, a kind of contemporary analysis of hers that was very like kind of intimate and almost kind of flamey, like her response to, you know, being frustrated after a long day of modeling. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was so, so exciting because then, you know, then we really could kind of get in her mind and, and um, yeah, try to create like a whole world that she was, you know, guiding us through. It's interesting, yeah, that you have these sort of her ana- analyzing what's going on in her life as you have the archival materials to do so. Um, it is, she is a really fascinating figure and she embodies a sort of tension of, being a model, you know, being, uh, you know, posing in Playboy or, um, you know, being in these Bond movie posters and, and pulp paperback novels, um, which you can see in the film is feels like a real sort of like fun collaboration for her with some of these photographers and artists. But, um, you know, it's almost like she was so uh, so interesting for television people because she was so beautiful and she was so candid and frank and she, but she's, she's sort of like this sex object that's like biting back or something like you know so I I don't even know what my question is other than just that like she imbo- like part of what this film is so interesting is how she embodies this tension but you really do bring that to life I think with all of the TV materials as well and and how did you sort of select what you wanted to show and how to present all of these television appearances and some of the more challenging ones as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we wanted the the TV appearances to really um, to really be the the mirror, you know, Um, if in in kind of I think in some of the ways that she is beautiful and seductive and alluring and all of those things, it's kind of like um, you really, I think you see the tension in people's response to that and them not knowing how to handle right. it, which is exactly, it's almost exactly. like a, like she was holding a mirror up to our society about the double standard. She has but, no problem embodying her own words and voice and opinions, but it's other people who are like, what? I can't deal with this. Yeah, exactly. So we were trying to, with the, with the TV appearances, I think that was kind of the, the line of the narrative, which was about, um, you know, our response to her and more largely our backlash against second wave feminism, Mm -hmm. you know? Because at the beginning you see even Geraldo Rivera is like in on it, you know? Mm -hmm. He's like, in fact, at the end of that show that we showed, he's exhorting men to fill out her mail survey. You know, he's saying like, this is gonna be amazing and I just think everybody should fill this out, you know, and this is wonderful. And for me, that time in the 70s when we, I think like until about 76, (laughs) we had this like window where people were really, excited about kind of a changed society and I I think with you know my previous film Crip Camp and with this I you know was very I'm very interested in telling those stories to remind us that that's possible yeah. you know that we can kind of be um, collaborating together and kind of making a more equitable world and I think people were doing that and I think then you see people start to you know feel challenged feel intimidated um, feel emasculated, whatever, and, um, and, and slap back. Mm -hmm. And then when she does the mail book, that's like a bridge too far, you know? So that, that leave it to the women's show was a perfect way of showing that. Um, and then it kind of comes to a head at Oprah. Um, you know, I think, um, but then the other thing that's happening of course is media consolidation and the rise of gotcha television and cable television and the way that you can take a person and just kind of like bat them around like a cat with a toy and that can become you know commercially um advantageous for the media and um and Cher herself wrote an analysis that i read that she was thinking maybe she was one of the first people that that happened to and then you know from over in europe she saw it happening to other women again and again and again yeah i mean it is interesting you sort of progress from these talk shows maybe even, you know, to give Geraldo a little credit, like some of these talk shows that are actually talking where people are sort of puzzling through how they feel about these things and really having long discussions. And then we end it obviously with the Maury Povich um, encounter, which is like, you slapped this limo driver. And, and, 
that kind of gotcha sensationalism. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, you're mapping sort of television, uh, throughout her career as well, you know, from the early seventies to, you know, essentially what drove her away, um, which is so tragic. And it's, it's interesting that you brought up Crip Camp because I find that movie so incredibly inspiring. Um, just the organization of, of people trying to make the world a better place. And this film is very sad <laughs> and kind of, um, disappointing in a way that that we haven't been able to um figure out a way to uh organize in the same way in, that we had in the early 70s but yeah it's like the world is very scared of women talking about sex <laughs> i think it's like more scared now than it than we were in 1976 when the book came out yeah you know? I think yeah we're, absolutely I think we're more, we've been scared you know scared to do that mm -hmm. um and in fact even for us working on the project you know, we we now throw around the word clitoris all the time, and even with my teenage boys, you know. But when I started the project, that was not happening, you know. Uh -huh. And we would like literally giggle when we were first, you know, having Zoom calls about the project because we would have to say these words, and we were realizing we never did, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I mean, I think I think where I find hope though is really the way that Cher was one of the early people who I think really started to challenge our ideas about sex and gender being social and political constructs, and that's really at the core of what she's trying to say. Um, I think that, that that has been broadly accepted by so many people in our society in a way that it really wasn't then. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and there's a lot of ways in which we're discovering as we're traveling around with the film that especially younger generations are have no trouble at all just seeing Cher and all her complexity. I mean, she's certainly no saint. Um, you know, you see all of her kind of like challenges with behavior and whatnot in the film. Um, but, but younger women are just like, you know, love her. Mm -hmm. They love her and all her complexity. They have no trouble with the double standard. They don't, you know, they don't have trouble with the fact that she bought a fancy apartment or is wearing really sexy clothes or how can she be trying to talk seriously when she looks like that or all those things are just like not even an issue mm -hmm. anymore. And so um, so that's been really fun to see. You know, I think that 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 generation is really ready for for share. Yes, <laughs> I, I don't know if if the older generations really are, though. Yeah, I saw a, a, a letterbox review by a friend of mine who's um, in her mid 20s and she was like, the way that these men on the Oprah show are talking to Cher Heights, who's like, is the way that men talk to me online on Twitter. Oh, you know, you know, if you would read the article, if you would read the book, you know, if you would read this. So I think it is, it has gotten better in a way, but there is still, I think that sense of seeing the men sort of like shut her down with these arguments that are unfounded essentially um, because they haven't done the research is still familiar <laughs> but i think a lot of young women do like seeing that representation of that that she is you know of feminism that feminine feminism and mm -hmm. very complex uh person who wasn't afraid of her own sexuality and her own image i love the glamorous image that she brings to everything it's a very theatrical approach yeah it's very cinematic yeah which was one of the things we were so excited about in tackling. I mean, at first, you know, at first we had a small amount of footage and we were looking at it and we loved the story. And I had heard the voices of the women, you know, the survey respondents. I'd heard some of the cassette tapes and, you know, obviously read the book and heard those voices in there. And so I knew I wanted to do the film, but I was a little worried about Cher. I was a little worried. I think I was, I had a lot of inter internalized kind of, you know, misogyny and notions about her that I think probably I remember from growing up and hearing about her. And I thought, well, she's a little cold and she's a little distant and she's a little weird. And why does she dress like that? And this kind of thing. And then as we started seeing more and more material and kind of falling in love with her in the edit room, um, you know, just we, we discovered like we would interview people and they would beg us, please show she had a sense of humor. Everybody thinks she's so cold and you know, distant, but she was so funny and she was so, you know, she, she just, she was so generous and all of these things. And so it was really an interesting exercise in like how effectively people get turned from kind of like their 3D, you know, human <laughs> personhood flattened down to some yeah. kind of like two dimensional 
caricature and um, and how effective that is at, at, at erasing somebody's you know thoughts and work and contribution. Um, I always like to ask uh, documentarians who work in archival uh, materials, like, was there anything that you wanted to include that you that you couldn't fit into this film or like a piece of footage that you were like, no, I, I miss it. Yes. Um, <laughs> do you want to tell the story, Lauren? No. Okay. Um, so we, um, I, I made Lauren edit this uh, incredible scene about the Persian shop, which is this uh, store that Cher would get her, her fashion at. And in oh. fact, she co-created these incredible silk suits out of this precious Le Lebanese silk that was woven with uh, gold and silver threads after the height report came out and she was living in the Fifth Avenue apartment. And she found this store on Madison Avenue and she befriended this guy, George, who had been a, like a couturier in the 50s for Bergdorf Goodman and whatnot, but he had this shop of things from Lebanon. And um, and we, wa we, we heard it was still there from James Hamilton, the photographer who's in the film. And we walked in there and the son of George was like, oh, Cher Height. Like, we were family friends with Cher Height. I used to peek in on the dressing room when my dad was fitting her for these suits, and she was so beautiful, and yada da. And um, they still had the bolts of silk on the shelves. That like she, That were from the suits? That, yeah. Oh, wow. So silk with, like, uh, the story of Adam and Eve, or, like, Byzantine, you know. Um, in it, It's so, so beautiful. And then, we, you know, we have pictures of her in those suits, and so we made a whole scene about kind of like how did she create share height you know yeah. how did she create that image for herself and how that was important to her and how it was kind of armor for her um yeah and it was beautiful and um but then it it went on for too long and i i also made lauren edit a whole scene about rusty <laughs> the dog because share oh the Cher dog is so sweet <laughs> yeah she wrote a um children's book about rusty rusty's day and sent going to oh. you know around new york city and um and so we tried that too but um yeah it you know it's long enough <laughs> um well i love how you open the film as well with her neighbor sort of seeing her on the street and then, you know, becoming one of her, her colleagues and working with her. Um, because it does, I think, lend to this idea of like the way people saw her and then got to know her. And so I think that that um, is part of what you're doing with this film is is taking a look at her image and then also kind of making her a, a three-dimensional person, as you said before. Um, you spoke about it a little bit, but I, I'm wondering what the reaction has been from audiences who have seen this film. Are they surprised that they don't know more about her or are they sort of like happy to see her name back in the in the culture again what have been some of the the interesting reactions i mean it's been extremely interesting you know i mean a lot of younger women like buying the book in the theater you know yeah. they've already bought it like 15 of their friends have already bought it by the time you know the the movie's over um but i think um you know i was in ohio and i had many people coming up to me and they couldn't even talk. They were so upset. Um, I think people are really suffering a lot, you know, like literally having traumatic um, stories in people they know in their own lives because of abortion restriction laws in Ohio now. And so I think this subject is just very raw and I think it's a way to tap into that, like the core of you know the um, oppression of women's sexuality in a in a in a, in a maybe a different way, mm -hmm. so people were very emotional. Um, though I did have one man in Cleveland who who got up to tell me that he had a problem with masturbation just in general. Like it <laughs> sounds like a him <laughs> problem. Thinks it's, thinks it's wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not my problem. That's your problem, yeah. buddy. Yeah. But. Um, but yeah, so there's been a little bit of backlash, but um, I have had women in Salt Lake City coming up and saying, you know, I'm Mormon and like this is actually new information to me and I hope this film gets out there so lots of people can see it. And actually, you know, younger women and older women saying nobody ever taught them this stuff, yeah. you know? Um, so I think the response has been very powerful. I actually asked an audience in Oregon recently like, how did it make you feel? And it, the audience was mostly women and they mostly said angry, you know? So I hope it leaves people feeling angry and activated, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, I uh, remember seeing the cover of Women in Love at some parent's friend's house. And so, yeah, and I don't know, I was just like, oh, that looks really familiar to me. And I did go online and try to buy it from a used bookshop at, at the end of 
watching the movie. So I'm going to have to follow through on that order. And um, thank you so much for chatting with us about the film. And we can share more thoughts and feelings outside in the lobby. So thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Thanks a lot.